Hey folks, Quilly Keen here coming at you with a new tutorial for Unity 3D. We're going to continue our first person shooter type stuff, but uh, specifically this time we're going to focus on the shooting because we sort of left off on that kind of incomplete. And I know there's still a lot of people that have a lot of questions about that. So we're going to very quickly whip up a simple scene and then we're going to shoot at things. So I'm going to just create a plane for my ground. I'm going to make sure that it is centered. I'm going to make it uh, relatively biggish. I'm going to add a direct light source. Of course, we're gonna go through some of this stuff a little bit quick because you can always pause and rewind. We are going to save this. We're gonna call it scene. And all right, so we're gonna populate it with a few things. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into assets, import package, and I'm gonna bring in the character controller package. You should have done this a few times by now. It shouldn't be particularly mysterious what's going on. We're just gonna use this for all the first person controls so that we don't have to worry about doing the movement or anything like that. In fact, I'm gonna go into standard assets, the character controllers. I'm gonna grab the first person controller. I'm gonna drop it right in my scene. I'm gonna, again, make sure that it is centered and except that of course it pokes into the ter the ground there so i'm going to just going to raise it up by one unit so that way it shouldn't fall through the world and i think if we hit play right now we should get to the point where we can look around and we can move and we can jump and do all that kind of stuff okay so we've got the first person -y kind of aspect of it in place but what this is going to be looking at is the shooting aspect so i'm also going to set up three quick targets just so we've got something to look at i'm going to call this uh target i'm going to i'm going to center it first but then what i'm going to do is move it out in front of us and move it up uh say i don't know two meters up in the air so it's just going to sort of hang there we will uh we'll create really quickly a material for the ground I'm just going to make it, um, I don't know, I'm just gonna make it darker. Throw that on the ground, there we go. So now we've got our target. I'm gonna turn this into an asset and I'm going to just replicate it a few times here. And all we're doing now, we're just setting up that initial scene so that we can practice and so we've got something to kind of interact with. All right, so there we go. All right, so we can hop around so we can see our objects, excellent. So what we want to be able to do is we want to shoot at these objects and we want to look at basically there's two different ways of having guns work in first person shooters. Um, and also if you're designed to play like a melee type of game, then uh, you might consider melee, but melee is really only a subset of the first type of shooting just with very, very, very short range. Um, you can think of it as a bullet that only goes out a couple of feet, basically the, the length of your arm as far as you can punch, or maybe a couple of feet beyond that if you've got a sword, for example. So, um, the two ways of doing it are a projectile, a, 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 bullet, a physical object that actually spawns in the real world and moves using maybe the physics system, maybe not the physics system, but moves and then when it collides against something, that's when it sort of triggers that you've taken damage. Now. Intuitively, that sounds like the most typical way that you would do a bullet, right? You spawn a bullet, you have it travel forward, and when it collides with something, great, it does damage. The problem is most bullets and, and projectiles uh, that you would fire out of the gun simply move way, way too fast to that, for that to ever be practical in a video game because it moves so far between frames that it's liable to just skip through things. And yeah, you can put in a variety of checks to make sure that doesn't happen, but the reality is that's just not the way most video games do it, except again for very slow moving objects. So when you've got something like a rocket launcher in a game, those rockets go really, really slow because it's the only time that having a real life projectile makes sense. The rest of the time they just do something called well, basically ray casting. There's a few terms that are applied to it, but really all we're doing is drawing a straight line from the shooter to the point where the shooter is targeting. And, and calculating what is hit, and the damage is applied instantly. As soon as you hit the button, it applies the damage instantaneously. Now, there might be a little bit of a visual effect that almost makes it look like there's a travel time, but it is just that, it's an effect, it's an illusion. And we're gonna start with that because it's definitely by far the most common way of handling any kind of shooting whatsoever. So on our first person controller, we're gonna add a new component, and I'm gonna make a script, oh, that's my old one, um, called I don't know, called gun, I suppose, right? Or we're gonna say, um, we're gonna call it performs attack. This is a behavior we're attaching to this guy. He has the ability to perform an attack. We're gonna do it in C sharp. Of course, doing it in JavaScript would not be terribly different. So we're just gonna load this up and it's gonna be pretty simple. First of all, 
well, a few things we're going to want to do. Um, we're going to want to respond to a left mouse click. And when that left mouse click goes off, we're going to want something to happen. So we're going to get into the first script writing. And up until now, you know, it's, it's been, okay, we've mostly used um, solutions and things we've done before or used built-in things. But now we're going to start to write some code. So how does it work? Uh, we've talked before, there's a couple of different ways to handle mouse clicks. I think that for this especially, the correct way of doing it will be in the update. This runs every single frame, and this will not be a fixed update. Generally speaking, um, you can do most things with just update, but frankly, anything that involves any kind of movement, and especially if it's physics-based movement, you want to do it in a fixed update. But anything that involves the user interface, you absolutely want to do it in just update because you want to trigger it every single actual frame because otherwise you might actually miss it. So in the update, we can do something like, and there's, a, again, lots of different ways of doing it. We're going to keep on the sort of simple side. If input dot get mouse, and then what do we want? Get mouse button or get mouse button down? Because we want it when they click the left mouse button, that's what we want to shoot. So again, the difference between the two is get mouse button down will only return true if the mouse was pushed down since the last time you checked, or in this frame, basically. If the mouse has just gone down, this will return true. But if you're holding it down, it won't keep firing. It'll only fire once. Whereas get mouse button will return true if the mouse is currently being held down. So get mouse button will return true every frame. Get mouse button down will only return true once. Which do you want? Well, actually, if you're playing a shooter, frankly, you could go either way. Now, obviously, if you're using some sort of machine gun that is supposed to fire constantly, you want to have this work on get mouse button. While it's being held down, keep firing bullets. I mean, you're going to have some sort of internal cooldown uh, to make sure the rate of the bullets is, is constant. But, um, but yeah, that, that's what you want. However, if you're, if you're operating on more of a, um, a, a, a gun that's like um, a non-automatic weapon, Right, you might want to have it on get mouse button now. You want, you might want to force the player to click, 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 click with every shot. Uh, in practice, I think most games are probably very happy to just do a get mouse button, uh, even with things that are supposed to represent non-automatic weapons, because the idea is you hold down the mouse button and your character is dealing with the, you know, the the reloading or the cocking of the weapon or releasing the trigger and pushing it back down again. You're not necessarily forcing the player to do that. So the player can just hold down the mouse while his character just continues to fire over and over. So we're going to do the get mouse button. It's going to be fine. It needs a button ID. We're going to give it zero, which is the left mouse button. And um, we're going to close this off properly. And by the way, if you're having trouble reading this, um, you can watch it in 1080p. It should be fine. But I just realized what I should do is, is give it a couple of zoom in levels as well. Why can't I use the keyboard shortcut? That's weird. Just to make it a little bit bigger. And let's give it one more. There we go. But again, uh, this video is available in 1080p, so that should really help things out considerably. Okay, so if mouse button down, we are going to do something. Now, we don't actually want to do it every single frame. We want this attack to only fire off at a certain rate. So let's say that um, this is a relatively fast gun and it can fire 10 times a second. We, we want to go ahead and do a, a machine gun type of thing, some sort of automatic rifle. We want it to fire 10 times a second. Okay, so we can do that pretty easily. We're gonna use a public float. We want a public because this is something we can customize in the inspector. And we're gonna call it, we just call it cooldown. That's very common, cooldown. And we're gonna set the cooldown time to 0.1 seconds. Uh, the F here forces it to be a float. Technically, it's not required here, but if you get in the habit of using the F to force a float all the time, it's going to be really handy when you're doing something like uh, a, new, a vector, a new vector 3. This explicitly needs floats, and if you just put like a 2.0 or you know 1.5 in there, this is going to be a double precision number instead of a single precision float, so it'll be a double instead of a float, and Unity will be all cranky and weird about it. So just get in the habit to put an F in there all the time. That's not something you have to worry about if you're programming JavaScript. It's just a C-sharp thing. Um, so we've got that. So what we also want is a float, which is cooldown remaining. Now, there's lots of different ways to do this, but this is the way I tend to do it, so what the heck. This is the way I'm going to show you. The cooldown remaining, it'll start at zero. So whenever the cooldown remaining is at zero or less, we can fire the gun. So if the mouse button is being held down and cooldown remaining is less than or equal to zero, then we can shoot. Otherwise, we don't. 
And also every frame, what we will do is we will decrease the cooldown remaining by time dot delta time. Now, technically, you know, this could be wrapped and only do this if cooldown is below zero anyway, but it doesn't matter. So cooldown might become negative at some point, but that, that's fine. That's fine. We've got a, We've got a check that can handle that. That's why you don't want to just check to see if it's equal to zero. That would be a bad idea. So, um, so that's fine. So by our current settings that will fire te every tenth of a second, but of course, maybe it's a slower firing gun. It's only one every second, right? This is going to be fast because, you know, fast is awesome. Um, you know what, I will slow it down a notch. We'll go, we'll go 0 0.2 just so that the effect is hopefully a little bit more, I don't know, visible. So what are we going to do when we shoot out? Again, we're going to take the first approach. This is going to be the ray casted gunshot. Much, much more common than absolutely anything else in uh, most first person shooters. So we are simply going to do a ray cast forward. We're going to find out what the first thing we hit. Now in a first person shooter, the targeting cursor is usually directly in the middle of the screen. And, you know, that brings up a good question. Hey, how do we get a targeting cursor in here? Well, I'm happy you asked. Uh, what we have to do is, well, we have to kind of draw one, actually. And you know what I will do is I will open uh, Photoshop and we will bring that in. Now, you don't have to do it in Photoshop, of course. You can use a variety of drawing programs. You can use many free ones. Uh, Paint.net should be fine. Uh, the GIMP should be fine. I'm just used to working in Photoshop, so that's what I'm going to use here. And we're going to start a new image, and it does not have to be very big. I'm going to do like 16 pixels by 16 pixels. Uh, I'm going to say I want a transparent background, definitely. And I'm going to zoom in. Zoom, 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 a bunch more. And I'm just going to grab the pencil tool. Uh, set the black. Okay, good. So, and what, well, I mean, you can draw whatever you want. I guess I, I won't overthink it too, too much. But um, what you might want to do is, you might you might be tempted to do a crosshair, but I have to be honest, I feel like, well, first of all, I did that a little too, too big, and I don't remember the shortcut keys for the eraser. It's probably E. Come on, yeah, E. Oh, no, but give me the, uh, give me the single point one, please. One point. Uh, for crying out loud. Sorry, guys. I am fly I don't want the pressure sensitive. 100% hardness. You know what I'm doing? The wrong one. Well, I feel stupid. Why don't I have my settings set properly? Oh, mode brush. There we go. Mode pencil. That's what I want. Boom. Perfect. And then the hotkey for the pencil brush is B. Good. B and E. All right. So um, the crosshair can work, but frankly, a little targeting circle, I feel, works really well. Now, you don't want to do it in just one color like this, because the problem is, if you end up being on a dark background, then this will no longer be visible. So what you want to do is you want to use a pair of colors. So we're going to use a, uh, a white square now, which won't be really visible the way uh, things are set up on this particular screen. But there we go. But that should work relatively well. So what we're going to do is we're going to say... Um, I'm going to save it for web because I want to save it as a PNG so that we have actual transparencies and that is fine and that's my YouTube thumbs right there so let's go to my C drive where I've got my actual stuff here and we've got our FPS guns tutorial under assets and I'm going to save this as crosshair there so now we're going to go back into unity we've got a little graphic in here and uh, did it not pull in the actual alpha we're going to find out. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a GUI texture. And again, lots of different ways of doing it. But I think that for this example, the GUI texture is going to be fine and easy. So I've just dropped that into my uh, world. And it actually defaulted based on the uh, the crosshair graphic that was selected here. You can see the texture is set to crosshair. And by default, it is set to, um, it is centered. Or is it? No, it is centered with these stats. Uh, because I think the coordinates, it sets it to, um, what am I lying about? Oh, here. Okay, the position, right? So you can move the position, and that determines where things are on screen. Now, it goes from 0 on the left-hand side to 1 on the right-hand side. And what you do, if you set it to 0.5x and 0.5 in the y, it'll be centered. But that is indexed to the top left corner of your graphic. So you want to do this pixel inset where 
you are offset in the negative direction by half your width and height. So my, my graphic is 16 by 16, so you want to go minus 8 in the X and minus 8 in the Y, and then it'll actually be centered right in the middle of your screen. So now if I hit play and I move the screen around, uh, now we, the, the mouse is not hidden, which kind of ruins the effect here, but you can clearly see we've got a little targeting reticule in the middle of our screen, so we know exactly where we're aiming. So what we want to do is we want to shoot a ray directly out the middle of our screen to our target, right? Now, how do we determine what that is? Very easily, I mean, we've got to do the raycast command, but the raycast needs a direction and a position. Well, because it's a first-person shooter game, we can determine that simply by using the position of the camera and straight forward from uh, literally the direction, the facing of the camera. That's all the information that we need. Um, in fact, am I wrong to think that camera.main has some sort of array? Uh, it has screen point array. Yeah, and this is what you would use if you wanted to shoot a ray out from where the mouse cursor is. So you, from here you would say, camera screen point to ray from input dot mouse position. And that would give you a ray that comes out of your mouse. So if my mouse is over here in the top left corner, it would shoot a ray out from here. But we don't, we don't need to do that. We can shoot it directly out the middle, which means we can save a little bit of calculation by simply using the position and the direction of the camera. So we want a new ray, all right? So a new ray, and the ray requires the origin and the direction, and as I said, we can use camera.main. Again, there's both main and main camera, but they are they're aliases to one another, they're both the same. Uh, .transform.position, and then camera.main.transform.forward. So the forward facing direction of the camera, this is the direction that we want our ray in. Now, our actual raycast, we will be doing using physics.raycast, and it needs a ray at the very least, but we don't really want that version because all physics raycast returns is a Boolean. True or false, did we hit something? Well, that's not enough information. We need to know what we hit. So we're specifically going to be using um, this version here where we give it a structure called a raycast hit or a hit info structure. It will fill it out for us and then we will get information back about exactly what we hit. So, um, so for that, we need an actual variable to hold this in. So we have a raycast hit object. The convention is to call it hit info. And that's it. We don't have to initialize it or anything because we actually uh, are passing this as an out. It's an output parameter. So this raycast function will fill out the hit info for us. Now there are a few other uh, variants. We can give it a maximum range, for example. By default, it's just going to do infinity. So if we leave it blank, it's that. Or you know, we could force it to infinity if we wanted by doing that. It's just going to pass it the largest possible floating point number. Or we could specify. We could say, you know, we've got a, a maximum range of uh, 100 units on our gun. And in fact, what we probably want to do is have that be something like, actually, let me change this around up here. Public float um, range. What is the range of my gun? Well, we're going to say it's got a range of 100 units, because why not? And then we're going to feed it in there. And that's going to be good. Now, again, this returns true or false. So we can wrap this in a like in a test like this. This will only return true if it actually hits something. So if you shoot directly at the sky, this won't, well, this will return false. And then we don't have to worry about doing any extra calculations. So, um, so what do we get out of this? We've got, so our hit info, there's two major things that we've got. We've got the, the hit point. So hit info dot point. This is the literal coordinate where our ray hit the other object. And this is good because if you want to do a special effect, like you've got some sort of explosion prefab or a ricochet prefab, like you want to make it look like, um, you know, a little puff of smoke, maybe a couple of sparks or something like that. You know, you've got these little particle effects. Well, this is the point where you'd, sp you'd spawn it. You know, you'd instantiate, instantiate um, my, uh, what do I call it? Like a debris prefab, right? You have some variable, some prefab that you've passed in a variable there, and then you would put it, you would make it appear at your hit point. And then, well, what about the rotation? It depends on the effect. Sometimes you want a rotation, sometimes you don't. Uh, another handy thing that we could help you with that is the hint info, hit info.normal. This is the normal vector 
of the, the collision point. Little things like that you can use to, you know, tweak your effect. That's well, well beyond the scope of this particular tutorial. Although this we might revisit. Okay, we're gonna actually leave it uh, as this, but we're just gonna use uh, quaternion.identity. We're not gonna feed it any rotation at all, but we can instantiate some sort of debris prefab. And you know how, Let, let's set that up. Uh, public float debris prefab and wrap this in if. If it's not null, if we have a prefab for it, if we have some sort of effect, then that's what we will use to make it look like we've actually hit something. Yeah, we'll go ahead and we'll create a, a really quickie one so that we can get some sort of visual feedback about where we shot, because otherwise you're just gonna have to take it on faith that things have worked out. In fact, let's uh, debug.log, let's um, no, hit point, hit point, like that. So then we can output that data. And um, actually that's a pretty good start, although we also wanna know what we hit, right? So. Hit info has a lot of data in it. One of the things it's got, it will tell you what the collider is that it hit. And the collider is just, um, I mean, it's a mono object, a mono behavior. So you can you can get the game object out of it. You can get the, the transform, you can get all kinds of things. Uh, there's also the rigid body. That's if there's a rigid body attached to that collider that you hit, which it's not guaranteed to do. So it depends on your game. Generally speaking, collider is going to be perfectly fine. So, um, We'll do something like, uh, uh, you know what? We'll grab the game object. Game object, so game object, like that. Uh, so we will also debug.log uh, hit object plus game object.name. There we are. So let's, uh, let's give this a try. So our first person controller does in fact have the perform attack script. We will name our targets. Uh, you know what? I'm going to set up three materials very quickly. Um, this is going to be, well, they can technically all have pretty boring names. One's going to be red, quick duplication. One is going to be blue. Uh, I guess I could have left it purple, but I wanted a true blue. And then one will be green. And then we will, our targets, we'll drop the blue one there. So this is going to be target dash blue. This is going to be called target dash red. We'll put the red on there. And this one is going to be called target dash green. And we'll put the green on there as well. So now let's do a quick save. Let's hit play. We've got a compiler error. Of course we do. Um, clear this out. Oh, first of all, our first person controller comes with a camera. Take your old camera and get rid of it. Otherwise, you're going to get those errors. Secondly, we've got um, cannot convert float expression. Oops, this should be a game object. So it's complaining because I was feeding a, a float in here instead of a game object. Now that should go away. Good. Hit play. All right, so we can click and we will Right now you can see we're hitting the ground. That's good. If we go really low, it'll actually return that it's hitting the first person controller and we can talk about exactly how to bypass that in a second. And if we could go there, so again, don't pay attention to the mouse, but look at the cursor in the middle of the screen instead. So we're hitting target blue, hitting target red, hitting target green. Everything works exactly the way that it should. So, um, so that's that. One thing we're gonna do is how do we avoid shooting ourselves accidentally. Um, there's a few different ways of doing it. First of all, in an actual first person game, a lot of times you don't have a model for your character in place. Uh, so you could theoretically hide that, but I don't think that's really the best solution because I think it's actually hitting the collider now that I think about it. You really do need the collider. So what's the problem? The problem is that the Bray is actually being fired from right here. And when we face straight down, in fact, it does bump up against the top of the cylinder. So one of the other ways you could fix it is if we literally took our camera and moved it so that that point where the ray is gonna come out of is inside our model, that, that is one way we can probably avoid that problem completely. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm aiming straight down and I'm no longer uh, triggering my model. Because the reason is, and we've talked about this before, um, models and colliders are single direction. If you're inside the model and shoot out from it, you will not hit the inside skin of the model, basically. It's only, stuff only collides from the outside 
to the inside, not from the inside out. And that is the same if we were to somehow, I'm not sure we're going to be able to pull it off, but if we can move the camera inside, no, it's not going to let us do that. Um, if we were to move the camera inside this object, or in fact, any object, and I guess we could do it um, this way. Let's see here. If I take my first person controller and move it so that the camera literally is inside the cube, and you can see quite clearly the camera, the origin point is inside the cube, but we can't see the cube over here on the right. It's because the triangles aren't rendered from the inside out. And it's the same thing with the collision boxes. So that's another way of doing it. Uh, the other thing you can do is if your object here is on a separate layer, if you have a unique layer for your player, you could mask it, but then that wouldn't really work because every player would need a separate layer, so that's no good. Another option is to do a raycast all instead of a raycast. And what this would do is it would return a, an array. So in fact, it's slightly different. Ray cast all returns an array of ray cast hit structures. It, it returns every single thing that was hit. And what you can do is you can sort through that or you can loop through that, ignore anything, any colliders that is you and only look at the others. But the thing is, it will return everything, right? It will return uh, the red cube and then the wall behind the red cube and then the wall behind that one and so on and so forth. And it doesn't return them in any specific order. It's not guaranteed to be closest first. So what you have to do is you have to loop through the whole thing to find which one of the objects that we hit that is actually the closest object to us uh, and also ignoring ourselves. So that is yet another possible solution. So there's a few goes. Oh, the other thing you can do is instead of having the ray um, have the origin of the actual camera point, which actually, I'm lying, I'm saying it's coming from here, but it actually comes from the center of the camera. Um, but instead of having it come from there, what you can do is move it forward, which is very simple because you have the forward direction of the camera here. And I got to sneeze. And literally sort of move the position forward, the origin position forward slightly. Um, I'm not convinced you've got to send it forward a full unit. In fact, I think that would be bad. The radius of this character is 0.4, and that's actually what you want to use. So it would be the forward times you know, 0 0.4, something like that. Um, but what you could do is something like you know, grab the current character controller dot radius and use that. But you know, I feel like those things are, well, it's unavoidable. No matter what, it's going to be a little fiddly. I suppose the only guaranteed way of doing it is do the raycast all method, but then I figure that I feel like that adds much more overhead. Um, so you know, just be aware if you're running into problems where you're sort of shooting yourselves, that's one of the reasons. Uh, in the previous game that I did for Ludum Dare in that first-person shooter, I used the, the method where I add the forward vector to the position, but the forward vector is a unit vector. It's a you know it's it's a one. So the origin of the shot was actually starting one unit away from the center, which was actually about here. So it would be possible to go and sort of hug a wall and then shoot through the wall because you'd hug the wall and it would, it would hug it from here, but the shot would originate from inside the wall. So you'd be able to shoot people through the wall. Um, although you couldn't see through the wall. So, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like the world's most deadly cheat or anything like that, but it was certainly kind of annoying. All right, so we are at the point where we are shooting and we're co correctly determining um, the which object we're shooting, but of course, nothing is happening from there. Now, one of the things we put in is the uh, the debris prefab. So let's go and do something really, really quick for that. So I'm going to create a sphere, and this is just going to be to demonstrate the fact that it exists. I'm going to create a sphere. I'm going to shrink it down, whoops, to a relatively small size, like that. And what I'm going to do is wherever I hit, this is going to be my debris prefab. So let me call it here. This is going to be Oh, that is misspelled. Or again, or, or ricochet, or or bullet hole, or all kinds of things. And I'm going to do this in your your actual game. You wouldn't want to just use a sphere. What you would want to do is load it with some sort of um, particle system, maybe, or some physics-enabled little bits of metal, so that you know it'll sort of fling off the wall and bounce on the floor. Uh, but you want the whole thing to have some sort of timer. You want it to um, self-destruct. So we're going to create a self-destruct script on this debris. So it just it cleans itself up because we don't want to last forever. And all I'm going to do is make it so that um, public float um, duration equals, I don't know, one second. Um, duration minus 
equal time dot delta time and if duration is less than or equal to zero we can destroy um, destroy ourselves game object that's one way of doing it the other thing too you in the destroy um, function there's a variant where you can pass it a certain amount of time so we could actually do this in the start we could have start and you know that I, I think it makes no difference it's equivalent but in your start you could just say start destroy game object comma duration and that would be fine too um, doing it this way does give you the option of like if the game is paused if you have some sort of a, some sort of pause manager in your game um, dot is paused you know oops so you can do something like if if it's not paused then do all this stuff so this gives you certain options that way but very simple script this will self-destruct after one second we're going to apply these changes to the uh, the actual prefab so it will clean itself up and we don't actually want it in the um, in our scene but on a first person controller in this attack we can attach this debris here now at this point everything we're doing is on the first person controller like how would you do this if you want it to be a factor of a weapon and the thing is having a weapon system is going to be a fair bit different. Um, there are different ways of doing it. Um, and, and the problem is there's actually just too many different ways of doing it. But, you know, some sort of array or you can have, um, you might have some sort of master weapon object. So you have some sort of empty game object somewhere that has all these perform object scripts attached to it. And, you know, they're all indexed or something like that. That way when the player picks up a weapon or ch selects a certain weapon, it just copies the, this script, this component rather, from this sort of master object to the player. There's, there's just way too many techniques to sort of go through them all. But, you know, here's we're actually working. So now, whenever we shoot, it should actually spawn a little ball. Let's go see if we've got that right. And it does. Boom, boom, boom. Oh yeah, and we can just hold down the button because uh, we're not actually using the cooldown yet. You know, and the balls are actually shooting themselves, which we can get rid of uh, if we take off the collider. Remove. Unless I am wrong. Yeah, there we go. So now the, you can't like actually shoot the point of the ball, but it still has the problem where there's no cooldown. So let's go and take a look at our weapon script. Uh, or do we? Oh, we don't reset the cooldown. That's the problem. We, we, first thing we want to do is reset the cooldown remaining to the actual cooldown location. Because once the cooldown hit zero once, then it was just auto-firing every time. So there we go. Boom, 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 boom. I mean, it's still firing you know, relatively quickly. But there we go. In fact, we're going to have the, uh, the debris cleaning itself up much faster. It's going to go away in a tenth of a second, even faster than we fire. Boom, 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 boom. There we go. So it, it eliminates itself pretty damn fast. Um, and of course, this effect would look much better, again, if you use some sort of smoke or explosion. I mean, by default, you could make do pretty quickly just with the assets, import packages, uh, and make use with the, of the particles. You'll have to shrink most of them down quite a bit because they start off quite big. But, you know, well, maybe we'll look at smoke effects and particle effects at some point. But frankly, that's not the kind of tutorials I do. I do the ugly programming things, and, you know, other people can make it look pretty, right? Um, and again, if you haven't already, take a look at the uh, multiplayer first-person shooter video that I put up. Uh, it's my entry for the London Dare competition, and it includes the full source of the entire project. And in there, I have it so that when you shoot something, it, uh, it creates a sort of cascade like of sparks, these yellow cubes that sort of spark off where you hit and bounce along the ground a little bit before they clean themselves up. And it, I thought it was a pretty good effect uh, for the visual style of the game. So that'll give you quite a bit um, to look at there. Okay, so this brings us basically to the end of this. Uh, oh, with one exception. Do we want the cubes to react when they get shot? Well, there's a good idea. And um, this is, again, very, there's not much to do there. But we're going to say something like, uh, we're going to go to our, our cube. Do we have it as a prefab? thought we did. Select. Oh, oh, it's in a subfolder. That's the problem. Hold on. Let me just move it to the base directory here so we can find it properly. Okay, our target. We're going to add some sort of prefab to this. We're going to call it um, health, right? Has a certain amount of hit points. So this is, I don't know, or has health. 
right? So this is an object that has health. It could be an actual player or it could be a destructible object, right? Some sort of barrel or a wall that can be destroyed, something like that. So it has a certain amount of hit points. Um, yes, public float hit, hit points, you know, equals, I don't know, 100 hit points. And um, which means in our perform attack, we need to know that it does a certain amount of damage. Uh, public float um, damage, we're gonna say it does like 50 damage to start off with. Um, and sure, why not? So we can two shot these objects so it goes quite quickly. And we don't need any of these. We just need something, we need some sort of public method on it that says something like receive damage. And it'll take damage. And float uh, amount. So hit points minus equals, come on, minus equals amount. And if hit points is less than or equal to zero, then die. Whoa, not dictionary entry, die. Where die is another function where we can do stuff. One of the things we're going to want to do is uh, destroy ourselves, right? But we could also, um, you know, again, spawn an explosion graphic or, or play a death animation. In fact, what tends to happen with a death animation, you usually destroy this object itself and replace it with a version of itself that's dying. That might be a ragdoll, for example. Um, that way, uh, future bullets don't have any game logic. There's no uh, controller enabled to it. All the a There's no AI on the object. So that's why you tend to do a swap. The alternative is to go through and disable all the components that uh, shouldn't be run on a dead body, for example. But usually the, the swap is actually the right way to go. It tends to work much, much better, much, much, much simpler. For now, we're just gonna, we're just gonna destroy ourselves when we die. And uh, I think that'll function pretty decently. So that is on our target, good. Now, on our perform attack, when we actually hit something, so in addition to spawning the debris, we wanna say, okay, our game object, we wanna get the component called has health, has health, and we're going to store it in H. Now, not everything we shoot has health. For example, we're going to shoot the ground. Well, it doesn't have health. It's indestructible. So we want to do if H not equals null, then we know the thing that we've shot has health, has a certain amount of hit points, and we can say receive damage, and we're going to feed it the amount of damage we have. Right? Sometimes this will be null because the thing won't have a health component, but there we go. So now it'll receive damage, and those cubes should die in two hits. Let's give that a try. One, two. One, two. One, two. Boom. There you have it. Destructible objects. So that brings us to the... Now this is, again, this is the most common, by far, way of doing this. If you want to have it look like there's bullets that travel, you want to have some sort of graphic that runs very quickly and, and and sort of doesn't linger, but you know fades off after a, a couple of frames. Um, you know, like this sort of trace around. And the fact is, in reality, you can't see bullets through fly through the air. You don't. You shoot a gun, the bullet is invisible, right? And what they will do in um, in situations where they sort of need to know what the path is, well, in like a machine gun type setting, every few rounds will be something called a trace around. It's not a real bullet, but it like glows brightly so that you can see the line of the fire so you can sort of see what you're hitting or what you're aiming at or how badly you're missing. Um, and in movies, they tend to make it so that every round is a trace around and the same thing in video games, right? So you can see it, but it's the same thing. It's the same idea where that's not the actual bullet because again, the bullet just travels way too fast and is way too invisible. So what you do instead is you spawn something like you have, for example, um, you could have something like a capsule that is very, very, very skinny. Oops, that is the collider, which we actually want to get rid of. Um, scale, yes. So we want it to be very, very skinny. And then what you can do is you can scale the length. And what you do is a, you can do a calculation based on, you know where the shot originated from, which is here. You know where we hit, which is, which is here. Whoops. Right, so you know the, the distance between the two. Well, you can scale this to be equivalent to the distance, and then all of a sudden, and of course, you know, rotate it, because that's the other thing, actually. You also have to rotate it so that it makes it from one point to the other. Well, now all of a sudden, you can have uh, something that looks like, looks like the shot, right? Right, if you have that just 
flash for one frame of animation. You know, have it have it stylized so it's semi-transparent. You know, we can put some sort of um, oh, what's a good material here? Um, probably something like one of the the particle shaders, the additive, and then we can throw that on here. And am I wrong that you know? Just have it show up, and again, skinnier, glowing, self-illuminating. There's different ways of doing this, and in fact, doing it with the capsule is not even the ideal way of doing it. What's m probably more ideal is to do it with a line renderer. Um, oh God, I'm, I know I'm going through a lot of topics very quickly here, but I actually it was not my intention to uh, to go into such details. So the line renderer is interesting because where the object is doesn't actually matter for the line renderer, and you've got this like ugly, ugly thing over here. Well, what is that? So the line renderer. Let me drop a material on here so it's not purple. The line renderer allows you to define any number of positions and it'll draw a line from one to the other. And what's fun about it, let me get rid of this, uh, this stupid cylinder. What's fun about it is it doesn't matter where you're looking at it from. It's always aligned. Let me, um, let me move this a little bit. We're gonna make it, uh, we're gonna make it thinner. And I'm going to move it up in the Y to the 1 and the 1. Actually, let's make it less thin. Let's go back to uh, 0.5 and 0.5. So it doesn't matter what view you're looking at it from, is it's always rendering like a flat square, but perfectly aligned to your view. So the width will be, will be perfectly fine. So then it means you can take this and again, put it relatively skinny like that. And you set the start and end points. So you'd set the element zero to be exactly where the camera is, um, which is, I don't know where. Let me, let me recenter our guy over here. There we are. And then go into my particle effect. And the camera is like right around there-ish. Actually, we'll bring it down a little. There we go. So hip length, hip height, hip height. And a red square is positioned at 0, 2 there. So I'm going to use this coordinate for the target. There we are. So there, that, that's how it works. Now you can do this all in code. Just look up the reference for line renderer. And um, again, if you take a look at my Ludum Dare a video or the, uh, the code base there, this will actually include all of this code. Just take a look at that and you will see exactly this sort of thing um, in practice. Right, and again, anyone looking at it from the side, and you just flash this for just the one, the one round, and or you can make it animate, and that's totally fine. So you decide that um, maybe you have it so that it only goes halfway, the first, the first frame, and in the second frame, you have it go the rest of the way. Right, obviously the height here is no good, but you do a little calculation, and then it gives you a little bit of a sense of a forward movement. So it's it's just about faking it, and a lot of things in computers are just about faking it, and that's definitely what you're doing here with this shot. So uh, I'm definitely wrapping this up at, and now. What we're going to do is we're going to come back with another video, and we're going to talk about actual projectile things. We're going to give this guy a rocket launcher instead of a uh, instead of a machine gun. See you next time, folks. Bye bye.